Hey, Marie, and thank you so much for joining us here on the Elevated Life podcast. It is my freaking honor and pleasure to be sitting across the screen from you. And not too long ago, I was in person sitting across from you at your book tour. And before that, 2014, sitting across the screen from your videos, watching B-School, learning how to grow my business. And now the fact that I get to have you on the podcast to share your wisdom straight from the unicorn's mouth. (laughs) I just, (laughs) I just feel so honored and blessed. So thank you for being here and sharing your wisdom. Oh, Brittany, it's my joy. This is going to be so much fun. And we were talking off, you know, before we started recording, just like, Oh my goodness, how much can happen in like less than a decade. It's so miraculous. And so inspiring. I think for all of us who are committed to growth, to see that these decisions that we make at certain points in time, to honor ourselves and to take that next step in something that we really want to expand, how it can have such exponential effects a few years down the line. It's awesome. You know, and to piggyback off that you're over 20 years in, so I can only imagine how you feel on the impact and difference that you've made in the world. I mean, how does that feel being 20 plus years into purposefully consciously choosing to serve and to help others? Like, how does that feel 20 years in? It honestly keeps getting better and better. And it has not been a straight line by any regard whatsoever. I've had up years and tough years. And, you know, it is a swirly, winding, unexpected roller coaster of an experience. And that said, there is simultaneously a level of ease and joy and confidence that comes with that time span because of what I just shared. I think when I was early in on my journey, I was so hard on myself and I was so incredibly desirous of creating sustainable success, you know, having that financial success to be able to keep a roof over my head and to be able to pay the bills and to not be terrified every time I open my checkbook, which I think is an experience that many of us can relate to at some point in our journey. And I also just had such unrealistic expectations, you know, this desire to have the business always go up every up, 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 up. And when you're doing this work and running a business for over 20 years, first you're beating the odds. So that's a really interesting thing. You know, over 50% of businesses, unfortunately fail within the first year. And there's less than 15% that I think make it over eight or 10 years, right? So it's like the odds just keep getting smaller and smaller. But the thing that's really great about this perspective is personally, it allows you to not take the ups and downs personally, right? Because you know, just like the seasons that we go through, there's going to be spring and summer, and there's going to be falls and winters. And if you can sit with that presence and understanding, you have the perspective you need to weather the storms. And then I think from an impact perspective, it becomes so joyful, like to connect with you and to connect with people who are past crossed five years, 10 years, even 15 years ago, and to witness how much people have grown and who they've become. And to be able to celebrate that with them is really, really special. You know, it's similar to being in a relationship when you're young, you think that person's going to be the one and it's, and you put all your eggs in that basket. It's got to be perfect. It's got to be everything. And I feel like the same is true in starting your own business is it brings up all of your fears. It's a reflection to your own personality. And I know that it's taken decades to cultivate that trust and the flow and the being okay with stepping backwards before you move forward. But what would you say to Marie 10, 15, 20 years ago to the, to the version of you that is frustrated? That is like, I've hired and fired so many people. I thought this would be easier. Like what, well, why isn't it not like to the level in which I feel like it should be like, what advice do you have to that person who's doing great things, but you just can't see it in the moment. Yeah. So there's a couple aspects. I think for me personally, one of the things that I've been really fascinated with and really passionate about is looking back you know, when I started the business in the late nineties, it was like 1999, 2000, right. That was like right in that little period. We didn't have social media. We didn't have a gajillion platforms. We didn't have things like this. I'm holding up my cell phone, ringing and dinging and buzzing and these notifications and all of this tsunami of information and demands and expectations on our time. 
And so I think I would have told Marie specifically 10 or 15 years ago to enjoy some of these new technologies, but don't get suckered in by them because all they're going to do is create a lot of overwhelm, a lot of insecurity and a lack of focus. And it wasn't until recently, I would say maybe within the past two to three years that I was able to start to parse through how to allow some of the newest things to serve me rather than me serving them. So I would speak to the frustration in this way to say, hey, Marie, keep your eye on the big picture prize. Stay true to what your ultimate goals are. What are the metrics that truly matter to you as an entrepreneur and as a human being? And don't worry about any of the other, quite frankly, bullshit that can take you off track, that can make you feel worse about yourself, like you're not doing enough, you're not creating enough, you're not going fast enough. And it has this toxic cycle effect, which creates insecurity and self-doubt, which drains your energy, which has you produce less and to feel less fulfilled while you're doing it. So I don't know if any of that's tracking for you, but um, that's definitely what I would say to myself, you know, 10 years ago, kind of before um, technology exploded in a way that I think none of us have ever witnessed in human history. Oh, no. It, and it, it, it really is such a pivotal point using technology for the business, because I often remind myself that 100 years ago, 50 years ago, there wasn't social media. Hell, 15 years ago, there was no Instagram. So yep. I have to remind myself that I was doing business even before the social medias, you know what I mean? And so it's it's got to be true that it's still possible without getting caught in the trap of TikTok and snaps and this and that. And it's just, it's too much in my opinion. And that's something that I really loved about B school is that it gives you the tools for technology to bring your message online. Whereas when I stumbled across B school in 2013, 14, I was working in my hair salon. I owned a luxury vegan hair salon. Well, it wasn't quite luxury yet, but after B school, <laughs> it went full blown pro, if you will. Uh, we went pro Marie. So I, I knew that that I have this message to share. And like you, I'm multi-passionate. I had just started a photography company after, uh, you know, being in the hair salon. I was always about colors and sparkles and empowering women and finding ways to like make them feel good, whether if it was the way they looked, their hair, which, you know, your language girl, your hair and your, your sass is what really drew me in. It was like, she's real. And I don't feel like with so many marketers, I feel like there's just so much bullshit. To, and I wouldn't consider you a marketer, but you are a marketer in a way. Oh, I love marketing. Yeah. Because yeah. And to just, and I don't want to interrupt your point too yeah. much, but for anyone listening, I wear that title with pride because I believe so deeply in the training and the content and the courses that we create, because I know if I can get people to do that work, they become the people that they most want to be. So that's why I will raise that flag, but keep going because what you were saying is so brilliant. Yeah, well, it makes sense because you can have all the talent in the world, but if you're not known, if you're not putting yourself out there with the marketing tools, and I always like to refer back to Snuggie. Snuggie is a crappy product, but we all know about it. We all probably have had one or been gifted one. And it's because the marketing was there. And so for me, I, I agree. Marketing is a great thing with the intention behind it. That's and your right. intention is to foster people's passions and talents and turn their um, impact the way that they can help people into income. And I think that's what separates you as a mark, quote, marketer yep. from other people marketing is like you're doing it with heart and soul. And that wins out every time. And I think oh, that's yeah. why you've been so successful, so sustainably long because and there's soul behind it. It's a, it's a really important distinction that I want everyone listening to really get. So listen up to this one. Early on in my journey, when my business was just a baby business, but it was starting to gain traction and it was starting to have consistency in terms of income coming in, me gaining more confidence and how to really impact people and create change. I remember I met so many women who said, oh my gosh, how are you doing this? You know, I, I have my own idea. There's this product or this service that I want to get out there, but, but I don't want to market. I don't want to be aggressive. I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to be manipulative. I don't want people to feel like I'm trying to shove something down their throat. So maybe I should just find someone else to manage the business part, the sales part, the marketing part, and I'll just be the idea person. And Brittany, 
I would want to slap the shit out of these people in the most loving way because I believed in them. And I would want to shake them by the shoulders and just say, no, you are so gifted. You are so talented and you are totally capable. You have to though, detoxify your idea of what marketing is. And most people understandably have a negative association with it. And so what we do is introduce them to a completely different paradigm that I call modern marketing. It is unlike anything that you've been exposed to before. And here's the best thing. When you are practicing real modern marketing, the best of your humanity comes out, not the worst. So you are listening. You're empathetic. You're compassionate. You're creative. You are generous. And you are doing things, creating opportunities, inspiring people into action in a win win scenario, meaning you are helping them take actions that are in their best interest that also happen to be aligned with your business's interest as well. So there's no, oh, if I get something, someone else is going to lose out or that you're taking anything from anyone. And you can build your entire business and all of your marketing to be a form of art for it to be an expression of your deepest values, of what you hope for humanity, for your ideal customers, the people who you want to serve, and to leave them feeling better for the interaction, better for the transaction, if that was it is, and better for the relationship over the long term than have they had not encountered your business in the first place. You know, it's so interesting because when I stumbled upon you, you were doing RHH Live. Yes. That was like, that's when I came into, into the gameplay and it's been really beautiful to watch your journey as an entrepreneur, because you've hit all over the place from time genius to your, everything is figure outable book, to a business program, to a relationship book back in the day. Like you really have covered, and I'm guessing those are areas of your life that were massive points of transformation or, or something where you felt you had acquired knowledge to share with. So can you explain a little bit about how you've been able to stay, to have such an impact in an empire and have so many different passions so that you know, what's the secret to staying focused? Like, how, yeah. because I, I see this all the time when coaching women is like, they want to do this, this, and this, just like I'm talking to myself too. Like, yes. I always say you can only focus on one thing at a time. So is that your approach? Do you focus on one project at a time? And over a period of time, you look back and say, Hey, look at everything I've created. Like what, how did you choose the first one? I know you have to start the right business to help people yeah. um, choose like where they need to go, but when you are so excited about multiple, like how did you, how did you, was it just what was important to you at that moment? That's right. So we'll speak to two of those things. So for anyone listening, like what is RHH? This was back in the day and it was a whole brand called Rich, Happy and Hot. Cause I was like, that's what I want to be. <laughs> so it was really born out of just my own heart and also my very playful nature. You know, I'm a little bit of a quirky human being. Um, I'm a person who just likes plain speak. And I'm a person who likes to talk and connect with people on levels that are real, you know, the kind of conversations that you would have with your friends over a tea or a coffee or a wine or, you know, a, a Pellegrino or whatever it is that you drink. And so to answer that first question, you know, the book that I first wrote I mean, the earliest version of this thing, it was called make every man want you or make yours want you more had to be so irresistible. You'll barely keep from dating yourself. And that was born out of my own pain because I was a mess in relationships. And I had to go through all of these different learning experiences, went for different training, trying to help myself not be such a hot mess. And that particular book was born over kind of several years and had different iterations. It was first an ebook, then I self-published it, then it got picked up by a major publisher a few years later. And then some of the other things that you mentioned, you know, B-School, for example, that was born again out of a pain point. It was the fact that I did not see in the marketplace one area that people could go, especially women, although it's not exclusive to women, where you could understand if you're someone like me who doesn't have an MBA, you don't have higher degrees of education, you don't necessarily have a trust fund, you're wanting to start something on your kitchen table on the side, you know, on the weekends, and you want to figure it out on your own without necessarily going with a pitch deck to go get venture capital, right? It's like a different style of entrepreneurship. And how do we do so in such a way that's aligned with our heart and our values and our soul and also retains our personality? Because Brittany, quite frankly, when I first, first started my business, man, I thought I had to be someone I wasn't. 
my idea of a successful businesswoman was someone who had like shoulder pads and was in like a <laughs> corner glass office in a high rise in New York City because that was my childhood imagery of what a successful businesswoman looked like. But obviously the world changed a lot from the 80s to the late 90s. <laughs> Right. And so I also didn't fit into that description. It's like, well, I like to laugh and have fun and I want to bring my whole personality into this thing. So B school was born again out of a pain point and to address something. And we've been doing it now for gosh, over 13 years. We've helped almost 70,000 small business owners start and grow their business. And so we're super proud of that. But over time, you know, you mentioned that we also have Time Genius, which, um, another thing born out of a pain point, both my own and then also watching. So many people right now feel exhausted, burned out, like they're pushing themselves so hard, but no matter how much they work or how hard they go, it's never enough. And people experiencing burnout. I had my own health crisis. You know, there were so many different things that kind of came with. And I said, this is insane. We can't keep doing this. This is unsustainable. Like I need to fix this for myself. I think I have some of the tools, but I'm going to go even deeper into the scientific research. And then I want to put this together so that people can get some relief and actually create a life that they love. Not like that's just some cheesy trite tagline, but legitimately feel healthy and well and vibrant and have more than enough time for not only their business and career, but for the people that they love and to just look up at the sky. So in terms of everyone listening, if you have a bajillion ideas and you're multi-passionate like Brittany and I are, first of all, you're in good company. <laughs> we are very creative greens. You're not alone. You know, right? You're not alone and it's okay. Um, I'm someone who has an ADHD brain. So if that is a diagnosis that you have, or even if you don't, many of us feel like we do, um, I want you to know that it's possible for you to not only experience success, but to experience peace and to also feel accomplished in what you're creating and that you don't have to do 17 things at once. You don't have to give up all your passions, but there is a way to set up your life and set up your business so that you create things in such a way that you give them the breath and the space that they need to succeed and you're able to nurture them. So then you can go on to another idea should you so choose. And that's kind of what we've done. So the answer to your question is it's both sequencing it's strategy. And um, there is kind of the spiritual confidence to know that you don't have to do everything at once. There is no lack in the universe. You don't have to grab really hard and think that if you don't do something right now, that somehow you're never going to have the opportunity to do it again. You know, I really resonate with you talking about finding peace in success. I've really reframed my own definition of success to be peaceful, finding inner peace, um, because, you know, we've seen the millionaires and billionaires commit suicide. You know, it's not money and success and fame and all of that is not the story that we've been told, like the shoulder pads had businesswoman, you know, right. I roll into the salon at 12 o'clock because I don't want to be a nine to five person, you know, and, and I feel like starting your own business really gives you permission to live that life that you love because there are no, they're not living by other people's rules. And, you know, something that really inspires me is you, you wrote the book, everything is figure outable based on this pearl of wisdom that your mom left you with. And I'm two things on that one. It touches my heart so deeply because in 2012, right before I stumbled upon you, my mom had a massive stroke that paralyzed her where she couldn't speak, walk. I mean, she was out like a light. And I, for the first time, had developed hope and faith in something and space to let it grow or to be or to accept what is. And when she finally learned how to talk again, I asked her, mom, why did you do this to yourself? I just had read The Secret and I was all into law of attraction. So I'm like, you manifest, you did this. Why? And she didn't even know how to, I mean, she could barely even say, I love you. And she looked at me so clear and said, because everybody needed something from me. And that hit me so deep that it sent me on a journey of asking the question, well, who am I? And am I following the same negative patterns, even though she's trying to help everyone and be of service and be this amazing, like empath healer, but she was doing it at the detriment of herself. And so that sent me on my own journey to look at myself in my hair salon career and go, well, what am I, what am I doing? Am I doing the same thing? Am I burning out? Am I overgiving? Am I not taking care of myself? And so asking those questions, I had to face a hard truth in my life. And it was like, hell yeah, I'm doing the same damn thing. I'm overweight. I'm unhealthy. I work till midnight and beyond. And just like, 
it wasn't good. And in asking that question, who am I? I went on this internal self-discovery journey and that then led me to finding inner peace and finding joy and finding confidence and finding the things that you need to be able to take those talents and passions that you are blessed with and, and have the courage to put them out into the world. And I'm so grateful that, you know, my mom said I would never, I would never take that back because of what has transpired and all the changes that have happened. But had that not happened, it wouldn't have sent me on my own journey of trying to figure out, you know, well, who am I and, and what do I need? And in doing that and finding those answers, I had so many people come up to me and say, what are you doing? Like, what has happened? Who are you? And that was when I knew that I had to step out from behind the chair and start sharing this wisdom in a different way. And so that's my question to you is you took a piece of your mom's wisdom and you turned it into your life mission. How does your mom feel about that today? Like, what is her, like, how, do, I, I'm sure she's just overwhelmed. Like, how does she feel? She, first of all, my mom is a very spicy woman. She's in her seventies. God bless her. And like, I still get Brittany. I get all caps texts all the time. Like this woman does not know how to text like any kind of lower caps, whatever. And it's so funny because she will say to me consistently, I don't know where you came from. You're not like your father and I, like, who are you? And she's super proud. Um, she's really sweet. She'll like make me dance videos of her and my dad and, you know, send me these videos of them. And they're, they're just so darling. They're extremely proud. And my mom just thinks I'm some kind of alien. And I want to set that context because my mom and I, we have a great relationship and we're extremely different in that my mom's mission in life. She wanted to get married and she wanted to have two kids. She is a hairdresser actually by trade, but once she had my brother, um, who's several years older than me, it was like, it is, you know, take care of family time. And she's like, how did you, where did these ambitions come from? You know, and yes, you're always traveling the world and doing this, that, and the other thing. I don't even know if you're my child. And I'm like, yes, I really, really am. So she's just proud and sweet, but it just goes to show like how unbelievably blessed we are. Even if sometimes we can't see it, my mom and I have not always had an easy or perfect relationship by any regard. But as you were sharing about your mom, there are these lessons that come through and it's my belief, actually, that prior to coming into this human form, that we choose our parents for very specific reasons. And even if in the moment it's painful and it's difficult and it's heartbreaking, that on the other side of that, that there is incredible growth and wisdom and a soul expansion that is meant to happen. So I'm, I'm super grateful that I got my, my spicy mom and that she is uh, still around. <laughs> making me laugh and figuring things out and sending me recipes and all kinds of things. If I ever have a challenge, she's like, oh, we can figure this out. And she comes up with, with ideas to solve it. That's so incredible. I love that. She's been an inspiration to you, even if it wasn't always easy. And it sounds like based on our conversation, I'm thinking a lot of the people that um, have the courage to invest in themselves and sign up for something like B-School to foster their talents and their skills probably have had a similar experience. They've gone through something painful or they didn't have it handed to them in childhood. And so they want to make it easier on someone else or pass that along. So circling back to you mentioning your health scare this year or yeah. last year, technically, um, what did you, what was the spiritual insight that you got from that? I mean, time genius was right around that same time. So I'm wondering like, were you over, did you find yourself like reflecting back now I was overworking or where do you feel like you were draining your energy and what is the new self-care practice that you have that you're consistent with that keeps that sustained energy going? hundred percent. So quick story on this one, you know, I've been someone who who's prided myself on my work ethic for my entire life. You know, I've worked since I was nine years old. I've basically never stopped. And, um, you know, in the early part of my career, I felt, and it was just what was working seven days a week, nonstop. So bartending, waiting tables, I would clean people's toilets. And then I was like trying to figure out how to start and run a business during the day. I had no clue what I was doing. I was horrible at it. So that <laughs> happened for a few years before I finally started to figure it out. Anyway, cut to the fall of 2020. And, you know, obviously that was a 
transformational year for so many of us, right? The world kind of turned upside down on its head. And I was FaceTiming with my best friend and uh, in the middle of the conversation, I winced in pain and kind of grabbed my stomach. And I was like, oh, and she's like, what the hell just happened? And I said, oh, it's nothing. I probably am eating something that I shouldn't. Earlier in the year, I had gotten uh, a blood test back that told me like I'm very sensitive to gluten. So I had to kind of cut that out for a bit. And she's like, uh-uh. Now this, my best friend happens to live with stage four cancer. So if she notices something physically, I kind of have no right to say, oh no, it's nothing. I have to listen to her. And she's like, you are going to go get an ultrasound immediately. I'm like, Chris, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I'm not going to a medical set. Like I'm not doing, she's like, no, it's happening. I get all these blood tests done. They turn out fine. I go to get this ultrasound, get the uh, mammogram, mammograms fine. When the ultrasound comes around, uh, I was laying on the table, one of those cold steel tables with, you know, the little paper gown and I'm just laying there. And the radiologist has got the wand all over me. And then all of a sudden she's like, whoa. And she's like, Marie, and she flips the screen. She says, do you know you have a tumor the size of a grapefruit growing outside your uterus? And I'm like laying there, Brittany, like, uh, no. <laughs> like I had no idea. And she's like, yeah, it's not the only one. And she, she started pointing out all of these tumors. And she's like, of course you've been in pain. We need to get you to a gynecologist immediately. And so long story short, turns out that I needed to get uh, an urgent hysterectomy because these tumors were pushing all of my internal organs completely out of place. It was just wreaking havoc. And it was at a time when Josh, who's my, my life partner, we've been together almost 19 years. He was going to be in Ukraine for a month filming a movie. And that was kind of prior to, you know, vaccines being available and everything like that. So we we're kind of all still collectively in a moment of just like WTF is going on and how do we stay safe? So I wound up getting this hysterectomy very quickly on my own. And it was a time, Brittany, when I, I had never before in my life had to take off for six weeks. So the recovery was like, you can't move really, like you can walk around gently, but you cannot exercise. And that's one of the ways that I keep my mental and my emotional health in check is exercise. And you just have to like sit and be, no, you can't work. You can't do it. I was just like, wait, what? It was a record scratch moment. So to answer your question, it really made me sit with and see how porous some of my boundaries were with the outside world how easy it was for me to work constantly, how hard I was on myself in terms of expecting to be a machine. And so all of this kind of came together and it helped me understand that I needed to really shift my boundaries to work a lot less, to work even more effectively and to take all of the tools the scientific understanding, everything that I had kind of learned over my career and kind of put it into a system that could help me detoxify and never go back to that old way of overworking. Oh, I'm so glad that you have come to that realization because a stroke is this, a stroke came from my mom having a hysterectomy. So it's really interesting how um, life will smack you with a lesson if you're not slowing down to receive it. And it, I find it interesting that it's in your womb space of your creative sacral chakra because you're constantly creating and putting out there. I too don't, I'm not having children in this lifetime. So I spend a lot of my creative energy into pouring it into projects and other things and other people. And, and I can understand how the boundary can get really thin because you just want to help. Yeah. Um, but we're just, we just don't have the capacity to help everyone if we're, if we're not 100% taking care of ourselves, And that's what happened for me is I was burning out just like my mom working behind the chair. And in the process of taking B school, I started asking myself, you know, I can help all these women to like foster their passions and their talents, because that was the question I started asking everyone, what are you passionate about? And 99% of the women that sat in my chair said, I don't know. And that's what really bothered me because I knew what I was passionate about. I was passionate about empowering women, making them look good, making them feel good. So I just didn't understand why other people didn't know and why they hadn't made that their mission to figure out immediately, not like wait until you're 50. I mean, it's fine if you want to wait, but like, at least you're do it, you know? Yeah. And so as much as I wanted to create like how to be a six figure salon owner and all of that, I was so guided to take the tools that I learned in B school. And I didn't know this was going to happen, but 
after going through finding your ideal client and all of those exercises I had never really considered, I would take anyone that would pay me. And I didn't realize that that was draining my energy. So I wasn't giving as much to my client, which was, you know, like, so the success cycle was, a, that was a trap that didn't work. And so I realized that as much as I want to teach people how to have a successful hair salon, if they don't love themselves, if they don't take care of themselves, if they're not nurturing themselves or having boundaries or saying no, or being fierce with their time, then none of this, the plans won't matter. They won't work. And so I find it really interesting that we need both. And that's, that's ultimately great. why I'm so passionate about sharing the school with my community, because what I like to teach is self-love, empowerment, confidence, reclaiming, reclaiming your power, essentially. But that's not enough. And having the business tools is not enough. You have to have both. And so yes. for me, my, my B-School bonus is, is a full-on gift of all things self-love, nurturing, confidence, to be able to help give the tools beyond just the business plan, because you need both. Absolutely. I could not agree more because it's like, we have these big dreams and these big aspirations, but if you don't have your health, you don't have your peace of mind. You don't have loving connected relationships that nourish you the amount of money in the world, no matter how much it is, it doesn't matter. You won't have anyone to share it with and you won't have the energy or the connections to actually enjoy it. So I'm so grateful that you're doing that. And I could not think of a better compliment to what we do in B-School. Well, I'm really inspired by all the work that you've done. I can only imagine like how many people you've touched and influenced without you even knowing. I mean, I know you know the numbers of how many people have enrolled, but you have to think about, I mean, I learned about B-School before I even bought it through a friend who was taking in. I, you know, tagged along and was like, wait, I want, you know, I want this. I want to be a part of this. And most importantly, I want to be a part of the community. I want to be a part of getting it out into the world. And so I just, I, I'm so proud of you for everything that you've done for paving the way for, you know, I know that it's not just focusing on women in B-School, but there's a, a huge, do you know the percentage of um, like what that looks like? It's close to 98%. And I will say this, and this thing really gets me fired up as I know we're wrapping up our time, you know, 88% of small business owners who are women don't net over hundred thousand dollars a year. And by the way, I have no attachment to the amount of money that people make. Everyone has different dreams and aspirations and different lifestyle goals and lifestyle needs. But that number tells me that there are at least a portion of women who are struggling financially who don't need to be, that likely have aspirations that go beyond that particular number and they can get there and they don't have to burn themselves out. It's about really identifying their ideal customer and creating a business and a structure and systems that support whatever level of abundance feels aligned with their heart and soul. Um, so yeah, there is about 98% women in B-School and we appreciate our men. We appreciate people of all genders, whoever wants to come, however they identify, but we do have yeah. such a powerful cohort of women and it's a real joy. I really believe that women are going to change the dynamic and the, just the energy that we bring to the, to the table. We're moving out of a hustle culture into like, like a feminine flow, ask for help kind of thing where we're supportive and compassionate. And I just am grateful that you are pioneering that path for so many people that are afraid to take that first step. So thank you for that. And to wrap up our chat, I would love to know what still drives you today. What is that motivating thing? Like 20 plus years in you've made yep. tons of books and programs and this and that, and you've met so many amazing people and you've done so much like what, what feels your fire today? I have to tell you, it feels like my God-given gift, right? And we all have them. We were all born for a particular purpose. For me, I feel so much joy in seeing other people win. And when I look out and I'm able to connect with someone as spectacular as you and spectacular as our B-schoolers. And so I almost see these incredible possibilities that exist around them, their dreams and what they want to experience and more freedom and more joy. And I know that with just a few simple tweaks and tools and understandings, some laughter, some funny stories, some experimentation, that they are able to live into their dream. And I know that I can play a little piece in just helping them aim in that direction. So all of the best of who they are comes out. And, you know, since I started 20 years ago, I've just gotten addicted to seeing other people win. And it's such a fulfilling and beautiful experience that there's no way I would want to give that up. So at this stage in the game, you know, for people that 
align with our energy, that want to have fun, that are interested in making a difference, that want to do it in their own completely unique way. Um, if we can help make a difference to them, it's like, it fills my heart and my soul more than almost anything else. So that's what gets me up every day. I love that. And is there anything that you're curious about learning or doing for yourself, like moving forward? Like, where is your head at? Like, what book are you reading kind of thing? You know, like, what's that thing that you're curious about right now? Oh my gosh. The thing that I'm so into right now, and actually tags back to the other question, which I don't think I answered fully, you know, you're asking about the self-care practice kind of after I had that whole experience. Um, meditation has become my obsession and I've meditated for almost my whole adult life. I learned first when I was 17 and I was certainly not perfect with it and certainly not totally consistent, but pretty consistent over the decades. But most recently, I would say in the past four months or so it's been every day. And I used to meditate about 20 minutes in the morning and then I would go on to my day. Now it's going into the hour zone and sometimes an hour and 15 minutes. And I am obsessed with a different level of consciousness and creating a connection with uh, the unified field, creating a connection with possibilities that kind of exist beyond the levels that I've created in so far. And it's been really, really fun to also notice the impact on myself physiologically, creatively, my connection with relationships, my energy levels. It's just been spectacular. So I'm deep into not only the metaphysics of it, but also the brain science, the neuroscience, the neuroimmunology, like the whole kind of kit and caboodle around a deepened meditation practice. Oh, well, you are certainly in the right place because the elevated life is all about marrying the science and spirituality together. And usually I have Chris on interviewing with me, but I wanted you all to myself today. Um, but Chris is a hypnotist and has been teaching and uh, practicing the meditation and guiding people through for over 20 years. I'm going to send you some of his meditations. Please do. Um, I can't wait. Yeah, because meet your spirit guides, connect to your higher self, clear the chakras, all the things, girl. Oh, I've got I've got some goodies for you if you're into meditation. And again, oh. thank so much for sharing your wisdom. Um, any last final words? I usually like to ask, what does living an elevated life mean to you? Yes. So I think living an elevated life for me personally is about being true to my highest and best self, to the one who is not engaging in fear or scarcity or not enoughness but who is relaxed in the present moment in joy and in the act of conscious creation. And it has not to necessarily do with the outer trappings, although creation is super fun in physical form, but with the emotions of, of joy and of love and of um, connection with others. Wow. You heard it. People relaxed in the present moment. That is the place. That's the place to be. <laughs> that's right. That is right. Brittany. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, Marie. I really appreciate all you're doing. And for all of those listening, if you're on the fence about B-School, get off the fence and just say yes to your dreams because you deserve it.